Hi, I'm Ambit Kosky. I'm director of the Banbury Centre here at Cold Spring Harbour. Uh, welcome to the 81st annual Cold Spring Harbour Symposium on Quantitative Biology. And the, uh, the subject this year is targeting cancer. One of a number of symposia on cancer that the lab has held over the past 40 years. And I'm delighted to have Harold Varmus with me this afternoon, a rather dark and dreary afternoon. Harold is currently at the Wild Cornell Medical School and the New York Genome Center. Harold, nice to talk to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I thought we might start by reflecting a little bit on the history sure. of this field. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the title today is Targeting Cancers. And the first the first symposium for which the word cancer or tumor appeared in the title was the it was the tumor virus meeting in 1974. Right. When I look at that volume, it's largely to do with the biology of the viruses rather than their cancer causes. Yes, I think that's right. And, and uh, many of us, many of the people who came to that symposium were interested in cancer and were drawn to the study of tumor viruses, either tumor viruses that carried their genes in the DNA form, like SP40 virus, or carried their genes as RNA molecules in the case of what we now call as retroviruses. They were drawn to these viruses because uh, they, they were able to change a normal cell into a cancer cell. And for those of us who believed that cancer probably had its origins in genetics, um, th these viruses, which have very few genes and yet were capable of changing a complex mammalian cell or an avian cell into a cancer cell, offered a promise at a time before we had molecular cloning and DNA sequencing and all these things that make modern genetics possible. I was just going to, actually that was going to be my next point, just a, a slight aside, that this was in the pre-sequencing days, the tools that were available. We, we had no idea how many genes were actually in a, a eukaryotic cell, mm -hmm. and we were looking for simple ways to get involved in the question of, of what sort of genes might be able to mediate this dramatic change between normal cell behavior and the excessive growth that is uh, characteristic of cancer mm -hmm. cells. By the time of the, the next cancer symposium in 79, just mm. five years later, mm. the title of which is Viral Oncogenes, which gives away what happened between 74 and, and 79. The field it does and it doesn't, because in fact, we knew a lot about viral genes, viral cancer genes, even in 74. In fact, some of the most important mutations, which you could mm. call the defining uh, uh, principle of, of, uh, of genetics, uh, traditionally, uh, had occurred in the late 60s and early 70s. Those they, are the temperature sensitive the mutants. Temperature sensitive non and, and uh, non-conditional mutants, the deletion mutants of Rouse sarcoma virus were first isolated in, in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, but w the reason viral oncogenes became so important is because we knew that at least in the case of the retroviruses, every one of those retroviral genes was derived from a normal cellular gene, and we had much greater capacity to study those genes when they were incorporated into viral genomes. Because at that point, it was still there was still it was recombinant DNA technology available, but it had not yet been widely applied to the study of, of cancer genes uh, from from uh, eukaryotic cells because there had been restrictions on the use of recombinant sure. DNA technology. With hindsight, which of course is a yeah. dangerous thing to use. The SARC result that you, Stalin, and, and Mike Bishop got seemed almost self-evident. That why was it so shocking that that was, that a virus would have a the, the viral oncogene? Oh dear, was was it a surprise that cells had genes in them that, when mutated, could make them cancerous? I think it was. I think was it was it, surprising. I think that there was certainly uh, there were many theories of how cancer might arise out. In the, in the literature dating back to the early days of the 20th century. And one of those ideas was that somehow uh, normal cellular genes either become too numerous or get deleted or get changed uh, in some more subtle way to generate genes that drive a cell to behave abnormally. What I think everybody was very surprised by was the idea that, that those genes could be found by using the genes that were present in the tumor virus of chickens or mice or cats. Uh, so that was the big mm -hmm. surprise. I, I know I certainly approached this with an open mind thinking 
all right, we're going to be studying a virus that has only a few genes, and one of those genes we know, when I entered the field in 1970, we already knew that there was probably at least one gene, maybe, maybe a few more, in a gene, in a virus like the Ralph sarcoma virus, that was required to, to uh, elicit this um, cancer, beha mm -hmm. cancer behavior in a, in a mammalian cell, or in, a, in, a, in an avian or mammalian cell. And uh, but the idea that that gene would itself be a slightly altered version of a normal mm -hmm. cellular gene was certainly not what I expected. I thought it might be similar to uh, a gene that's right. that, that that's present in a normal cell, but, but not an actual. But the fact actual that you could use this as a as a kind of early stage of a human genome project, yeah. getting out the cancer genes by looking at the twenty or thirty retroviruses that were known to cause cancer in animals. And that led to a whole raft of yeah. similar genes. Yeah, being because it turns out the RAS virus was, for experimental purposes, the best possible virus to work with because it was fully competent to, to grow and do all those interesting things we talked about in 1974 uh, with respect to its virus life cycle, uh, but also uh, had the ability to transform cells. And many of the other uh, so-called oncogenic or transforming retroviruses were more complicated. They were mm -hmm. defective. They, they could replicate but not transform or transform and not replicate and they had to grow together to allow the transforming virus to be propagated. So Rausakamoros is a great experimental tool and we were lucky to have right. started with it. I think of course been harbor for it. I wonder, do you know if Jim was disappointed or not? Of course he wouldn't be disappointed but the fact that he's bet on DNA tumor viruses. Well, DNA tumor viruses taught us a lot, and of course, once we had tumor suppressor genes to, yes. to, to work with, which weren't, sure. it, it, the, the route to discovery was just a little more complicated, but the role of DNA tumor viruses uh, ended up being yeah. incredibly uh, yeah. heuristic. Yeah, the what, the and, one a or the... Yeah, exactly, play. yeah. yeah. Uh, T-antigen RB P53 connection, so yeah. that ended up being very important, and Jim was very excited by the, by the discovery of, of cellular oncogenes. Yeah. And then, of course, once once people had got hold of genes, mm. you could look at proteins, and you can you could then begin to look at the functions of those pro of the normal proteins. You could. It was surprisingly difficult to identify the product of the Rouse sarcoma virus SARC gene. After all, that gene had been defined by both temperature sensitive and deletion mutants around 1970. But it wasn't until 1975 when Joan Brugge, working with uh, Ray Erickson, first showed that the, the, the gene makes a 60 kilodalton phosphoprotein. And uh, it took another few years before we understood it was a kinase, and another couple of years before we realized that it was a kinase that was of a special kind because it adds phosphate not to serine and threonine, but to tyrosine. So it was a long time between identification of this gene uh, as, a, as a, something defined by temperature sensitive mutations and 10, 10 years later, 11 years later, showing that it makes a protein, which is a protein tyrosine kinase, one of what turned out to be roughly 90 tyrosine kinases, many of which are cancer genes, and, and the targets for some of the most effective therapies that we're talking about it's in this meeting. Of course, that then led into things like the cell cycle. So the, the cell cycle from 91 was mm. now looking at, in a way, the, the retroviral genes in that work had, had provided a key but they were actually less central to that than, than the DNA tumor virus uh, genes mm. that, that interact with tumor suppressors. So the role of R, the RB gene and, uh, and E2F and, and P53 probably played a bigger role in that symposium than cell, cell cycle control uh, in its orchestration as opposed to G1 arrest and releasing G1. And, uh, and Retroviruses do a lot of things to bring a signal, a growth signal into a cell, but, but many of the components that govern the cell cycle itself, uh, not all, but, but many of them um, are in some ways more related to the mechanism by which DNA tumor viruses mm -hmm. transform cells. And then presumably the, the, as, as the genes and the proteins were normal cells mm -hmm. were examined, the, the, the role of viruses in this research diminished because you I, I think you could argue that. I mean, I, I do argue that in the, in the essay that we've been talking about um, because we had recombinant DNA technology and we were able to, mm -hmm. to, to make RNA, protein, DNA that, that could allow us to manipulate 
the, the, the functions of, of these genes that we'd identified in other ways. But I think it is important to remember that, that tumor viruses, both RNA and DNA, remain very important. In mm -hmm. fact, you, I think you could make, and I do make the argument that, that the work that was done on retroviruses mm -hmm. that cause tumors in chickens and mice taught us how retroviruses grow beginning 13 years before we knew what caused AIDS. And AIDS is caused by a retrovirus, which in its growth properties is almost identical to uh, the way these tumor viruses behave. I think people have to understand that, that the investment that was made in tumor viruses because they cause cancer taught us about a class of viruses that ended up being um, a, a way of getting prepared for one of the great epidemics of our, of our age, the, the AIDS epidemic. Mm -hmm. Um, it won't surprise you to know that there are only viruses are mentioned only five times in the abstract book for this symposium. <laughs> for this symposium? Yes. No, it doesn't surprise uh, me. Two of those are using them as, as, as vectors. <laughs> yeah, sure. Anyway, talking of this symposium, uh, tell us a little bit about what, about what you talked about the other day. Well, what, what are you doing at, at yeah, the moment? Well, my lab is, is now, um, we, we, for the last 20 or 25 years, ever since I became less of a tumor virologist and more of a, of a cancer biologist, uh, I've been looking at the ways in which um, normal cells become cancer cells. And can, in a sense, it's still the same general question, but it's being looked at in a different way. And our world has been transformed by high throughput sequencing mm -hmm. and the development of, uh, of uh, highly detailed maps of, of, of uh, cancer cells uh, compared to normal cells in patients in which those uh, cancers have arisen. So we know a lot about the really complex pattern of genetic mutation and, uh, and physiological action that, that, that is involved in turning a normal cell to a cancer cell. And from that rich repertoire of, uh, of mutations and other kinds of molecular changes, new therapies have evolved. So there's gene discovery, there's therapeutics. In between, there's a, a rich terrain in which many of us are trying to understand how that those constellations and mutations, which is which are different in every single mm -hmm. tumor, um, end up causing a, a cell to be to be cancerous and to have certain vulnerabilities. So we're studying, in general, three things um, about that situation. One is. Uh, uh, that I didn't talk about, although it's in the abstract that I submitted, is how mutations that affect splicing factors make help to make cells cancerous. Second, we're, one I didn't even put in the abstract, uh, was a, a, an attempt to understand why certain kinds of mutations are found in certain uh, kinds of cancer. What is it about the cell type in which those mutations occur and the mutations that give rise to what we call the cancer phenotype? The, the, uh, the behavior of, of, and the appearance of, of cells that represent small cell lung cancer, squamous cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma of the lung, three very distinct uh, pathological types of cancer that have rather distinct patterns of mutation. And the third thing which I did talk about is why certain common mutations that are seen in, for example, lung adenocarcinoma don't occur together. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's been very striking to people who are examining the results of sequencing literally hundreds of tumors of a certain type that uh, a, a mutation, a, a, a gene may be commonly mutated in, say, uh, in a certain type of cancer and occur perhaps in 10 or 20 or 30 percent of the tumors, and another gene may also be um, encountered in mutated form in a large fraction of, of those tumors, but never, never the, the two tumor. together. Why is that? Because there's no selective pressure for the second mutation once the first has occurred? Mm -hmm. Or is it because the two together are synthetically damaging? Right. And it turns out, as far as we can tell from the results I presented yesterday, that uh, the, the latter is the case. And that's interesting, because one of the things we're trying to do is figure out some novel ways to approach yeah, yeah. therapeutics. Uh, traditionally, people say, all right, you've got a bad gene, fix the, the fix or, or eliminate the protein that that bad gene makes. The other way to go is like, well, all right, when you have a bad gene, it creates a kind of vulnerability in the cells that it can't tolerate the loss of some other gene. But it's possible there's another kind of vulnerability, a vulnerability to a hyperactivity of some other gene. And what we're looking at in this situation 
uh, is a, a conspiracy of lethality that, that occurs when both a commonly affected uh, oncogene in many types of cancers, the so-called RAS gene, is combined with uh, a mutation in an epidermal growth factor receptor gene. Uh, so there's some way to mimic, uh, first of all, to understand why those two are not tolerated by cells, and we can mimic that uh, in, a, in a patient with cancer, we could have a new approach to therapy. I mean, but this sounds rather as though you've got a cancer cell with a, a RAS mutation. Right. That's the, the driver of that, if you like, of, of that cancer. That's one way to think about it, yeah. yeah. And you're, you're now going to introduce another bad gene into, the, into that cell? Well, I mean, remember, the, the, remember each of these genes, you, we call them bad, but we only call them bad because the cancer has killed the patient. But, but a RAS mutant is not bad for the cell. It gives the cell a selective advantage. It grows more, it dies less. It, 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 yeah, okay, yes, it yeah. drives the cell to success. Success for the cell is becoming a tumor. <laughs> It's, it's, it's not good for the patient, but it's good for yeah. the cell. Yeah. So what I think is a little surprising is that if you have two of these bad actors with respect to the organism, that they conspire to make life difficult for the cell. And that's a good thing for the patient. So uh, what we're trying to do is exploit the, the toxicity of having two hmm. cancer-causing genes in the same cell and obviously there are many occasions in which there are multiple cancer-causing genes in the same cell, but they don't have a toxic effect on the cell, but some combinations do. do. And one way to identify those is to look through these reams of data for mutations that are common, but are mutually exclusive, exclusive. that have never, never occurred together. How many, how many of such pairs have you, there, have you found? Well, we've looked at quite a, at, at a, at a few just by using computational methods and looking at, uh, at printouts of, uh, mm -hmm. of patterns of mutations. Um, we haven't subjected them all to this test, although other, there are some other labs that have looked at one or two of these combinations and have seen some form of, of damage in those cases. I don't believe that every mutually exclusive pair is going to prove to be damaging, but some will. And I think labs will need to come along and join us in this, in this expedition mm -hmm. and try to understand, uh, try to uh, enumerate which of the combinations are synthetically lethal because I think there's a potential for doing something important here if we can understand how is that lethality mediated? Is there some switch, some change in, in behavior right. of a, of because, a, of a because, cell that uh, we can understand and, and manipulate? Right, because presumably you, you needn't introduce a second mutation. If you understand the consequences of that second mutation, there may be something downstream that you can possibly manipulate. Yeah. I mean, cells, the one of the things we're learning as we treat cells with drugs that inhibit a single protein is that cells have a lot of, a lot of ways to escape the effect mm -hmm. of the drug. I mean, drug resistance can most simply occur because it's a secondary mutation affecting the target, but it can also occur because the cell undergoes a, a kind of rewiring mm -hmm. and right. works in a different way. And uh, so all of us are looking for ways to, uh, to put one kind of therapy together with another, so the cells have a harder time finding a way around the therapeutic uh, uh, con constellation. And I, I think there is a great potential here for understanding the wiring system better, because there are both negative and positive forces that operate in these signaling networks. Sure. Uh, I think that there, there are some opportunities here for understanding cells more profoundly and coming up with new ways to think about therapeutics. Let's just spend a couple of minutes on a bit of sociology. Sure. Uh, Preprint service. Preprints, yes. You've been a very long advocate of, of open access and so on. Indeed. Um, yes. Are preprint servers a further development of that? Well, uh, they're a further development in the sense that they represent another change in publication practices in biology. Um, but there are two points I would make. First, providing your work as a preprint. Um, by putting it online before it's been reviewed, um, is very different from open access publication. Mm. Sure. It doesn't involve a change in our business sure. plan, it's just another way to operate. Secondly, it's not really new, it's only new to biology. So in physics and mathematics and, and astrophysics and, and uh, computational sciences, people have been doing this through a preprint server called Archive mm -hmm. that Paul Ginsberg developed in 1991. So it's been around a long time and there are a lot of practices, a lot of great journals that we all use like Nature and Science are perfectly comfortable accepting for publication in a formal sense uh, after 
traditional peer review, a paper that was posted a year or two or three years but earlier as a preprint. So it doesn't really break new ground in that way, but it breaks new ground for biology, and we're all hemmed in by our cultural traditions. Why do you think biologists are, are reluctant? The experience of bioarchive here at Cosmic Harbor shows that reluctance is de decreasing somewhat. But why do you think biologists are um, uncomfortable with preprints? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure it's 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 inherent to the nature of the life sciences. Some people argue that it is. I don't think so. I think what's happened is that uh, you know, we didn't adopt it mm. when the physicists did. Not sure why. I think it just wasn't known, wasn't part of the culture, and we didn't see a big need for it. <clears throat> and I'm not sure why we didn't see a need for it. Maybe because we had a lot of meetings at Cold Spring Harbor to, to talk about our results. But I think the times have changed so dramatically now that, that everyone's so worried about competition for jobs and for grants and so much of the determination of who's going to advance in their career has been formed around the question of publication in certain traditional journals, the most high-ranking journals, that people are very nervous about changing their publication practices. Yes. I find this a cultural norm that we need to fight. For, for one thing, we should not be evaluating each other based on what journal we publish in. We should be evaluating each other based on the quality of our work. Secondly, we have to remember that we're scientists um, paid to, to spend these highly enjoyable years of our lives in laboratories, um, working with, with brilliant colleagues, in order to make discoveries and share them with our colleagues. Mm -hmm. And what better way to do that than to get the work out early in the form of a preprint which you can still publish in a distinguished journal later on. The journals are not resistant to this, possibly excepting one or two. Yeah. Well, we've overrun, not surprised. Thank you very much indeed, Harold. Thank you very much, John.